Hello, welcome to How I Built It, uh, the stream where we invite folks who are building software with Cockroach DB to tell us about uh, who they are and how they're making things and how they're using Cockroach. Uh, I'm Nathan Stowell, a member of technical staff here at Cockroach Labs. Joining me today are the creators of Bitsky, an NFT marketplace. Uh, Naveem Malloy is Bitsky's COO and Patrick Tresher is their CTO. I wanna welcome them both to the stream. Awesome. Gentlemen, hey, hi, how's it going? Hey, Nathan. You're doing great. Thanks so, for having us. Yeah, yeah. It's good. I'm glad to get you guys on today because uh, maybe some of the other folks on the stream are like myself and only heard about an NFT or a non-fungible token about three weeks ago uh, in some headlines that have been coming out recently. Uh, so maybe we start with a very simple question. What is a non-fungible token? Sure. Um, yeah, an NFT is, uh, or also known as a non-fungible token, is uh, kind of the source of truth of who the provenance of a digital asset and also um, who owns it on the blockchain. Um, Pat maybe can probably dive into more technical explanation <laughs> of how it functions. Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, most of the blockchain up until uh, a short time ago was based around currencies. And the idea was you sort of have these balances, you can move fractions of things around. And recently people have been playing with the idea that you can actually have a unique individual asset that you can transfer from person to person. The blockchain will ensure that there's only one of those and that when you transfer to someone else that you no longer have it in your wallet anymore. And it sort of keeps track of that little, um, you know, it's a token. Uh, but what people have been doing is now tying that token to all sorts of other digital assets so that you can sort of keep track of who owns a piece of art or an in-game video character, video game character, or something like that. And um, so linking those sort of basic tokens of the blockchain to other things is sort of what we would call an NFT. Um, and when we talk about NFTs, we talk about fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens. Um, Fungible tokens being like a currency where I can divide it by you know many points. I can send, I can receive ten dollars and send you a dollar. And non fungibles being uh, things that are whole and can't be split up. Yeah, actually, I don't know. When I hear the word fungible, uh, immediately I'm like <laughs> uh, economist. Uh, I am not. So <laughs> fungible it simply has to do with the fact that one bitcoin is the same value and equivalency to another bitcoin. Is that? Is that kind of how I understand it? Whereas we're talking about unique pieces of artwork or uh, a character, an asset in a in some kind of game world or virtual world, and so like they don't have an equivalent value or meaning. Perhaps uh, is that kind of the basic of, of how it works? Yeah, I think if you think about it in terms of like the collectible world. Um, you know, the uh, scarcity uh, or the limited edition um, aspect of it. So if you think about it, uh, like if you have, you know, one Bitcoin or one Ethereum, um, you can store it uh, in a wallet or on an exchange. Um, it doesn't really matter which token, which exact Bitcoin you get back, as long as you have one. And that doesn't work well if you have a limited edition, like one of one like Banksy painting, like you want to make sure that you yeah. get that back because there's only one of them. So that's the um, correlation with like NFTs. And that's um, kind of segueing into how we've structured our platform to store um, those NFTs in our, in our wallet infrastructure. Yeah, so this seems like a perfect, <laughs> a perfect time to introduce uh, Bitsky. So yeah, how does Bitsky, so is Bitsky a wallet? Is it a marketplace? Is it an exchange? Like how does it kind of fit into this picture? Is it all those things? Uh, short answer, yeah, definitely all those <laughs> things. So we've um, we've been building this space for a while. Um, started with a building a wallet infrastructure um, because we got really excited about the idea of digital asset ownership and with with NFTs. And the common um, theme in order to enable that is uh, where people can store it, and that's that's the wallet. Um, so we spent several years um, building that out. Um, Patrick, you know, led the led the charge on that, how to architect that, and we've built uh, a simple, very easy to use uh, wallet 
um, with like single sign on, which is very similar to like Gmail and all the other applications you're used to with like Swiss level bank uh, security. And that we have these hardware security modules that are racked in biometrically secure data centers that are regionally distributed that, um, the, you know, keys never lead hardware. So it's like a digital lockbox for your uh, collectible. So I guess like in terms of collectible, I mean, I'm, I'm reading a lot about Ethereum and I'm not, I guess like super well versed in uh, crypto in general, right? But I know there's like various currencies, uh, which I'm assuming represent various uh, blockchains, right? So there's Bitcoin, which is probably the most well known, Ethereum, Dogecoin, which is getting talked about quite a lot recently. Uh, so for these non fungible tokens, they, they exist on a specific blockchain. Is that right? And so as you're sort of collecting them, you're collecting them uh, on that blockchain, kind of in that currency. Is that, does that make sense? Am I thinking about that the right way? Sort of, yeah. So all the blockchains originally started out with their, they sort of have a native currency. Um, mm. And that's sort of required for the blockchains to operate, um, largely because in order to move things around on any blockchain, there's a limited amount of space. And so... <laughs> people pay transaction fees in order to get access to that limited amount of space. And so those transaction fees need to be paid in some sort of currency. So on Bitcoin, that's the Bitcoin currency. And on Ethereum, it's the Ethereum currency. Um, and on Bitcoin, that's basically just powers moving uh, the currency around. But on Ethereum, um, there's actually a complete programming language where anybody can write any sort of application on top of it. And there are other chains as well that do this, but Ethereum was sort of the first big chain to do this. And most of the activity around these types of applications uh, is on Ethereum. Um, so that's sort of where NFTs were sort of like invented and, and, and evolved. Um, and there are other blockchains that can do NFTs as well. Uh, but Ethereum is basically sort of has the the most momentum, like probably 99% of all NFTs that are being used on Ethereum. Got it. So, so, easy. so an NFT is like a feature of a certain blockchain and Ethereum being the foremost, and we expect to see other blockchains, new blockchains also sort of joining in and uh, so is Bitsky, I, I assume there's like many different cryptos you can sort of keep in the Bitsky wallet. Are you specifically focused right now on Ethereum around this sort of like uh, NFT or are you looking at other uh, blockchains uh, who, who might enter into this NFT space? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we, <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> so yeah, so we're primarily um, built on Ethereum, um, hmm. but we have the ability to support other, what is called like uh, layer twos that are um, built on top of Ethereum, which have, you know, unique characteristics in terms of like faster transaction time or these other like kind of uh, bespoke uh, features that are on top of um, build of Ethereum. So uh, yeah, we have the functionality to kind of uh, move or transition to other tokens um, that are built on top of Ethereum. Very yeah, cool. One of the concerns right now is that, that when you Ethereum, you're competing with everyone else on Ethereum. So all the NFT art marketplaces are competing for the same blockchain space with a bunch of financial products that are doing lending and things like that. And uh, that's driving the cost up. So there are lots of people looking at different chains. Um, some people have built their own. Some people are switching to, to sort of competing um, chains. Um, and some people are figuring out ways to make things cheaper on the Ethereum blockchain. For now, almost all the successful projects are still on Ethereum. So it's hard for us to move off. But we are inherently a crypto wallet, not necessarily an Ethereum wallet. So if there are chains that start taking off and people are working on them, um, we'll probably be adopting those as well. And I think most people in the industry are probably going to follow suit. But so far, no chain has really popped up as like the next chain to, to do things on. So it's still all Ethereum. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, this seems like a 
a kind of volatile space that can change uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> and so like, yeah, it's good to be forward facing. Uh, we have a question from the chat. Uh, why, why is a Bitcoin an NFT, but a dollar is not an NFT? Uh, I think that goes, cause it goes back to what we were talking about just a second ago. Uh, so I don't think a Bitcoin or a dollar are an NFT. Those are, those would be um, fungible uh, on, on, the, on the crypto. <laughs> Uh, blockchain, whereas we're talking about uh, specifically things that exist on a blockchain that are not fungible. And definitely correct me if I'm getting that wrong, because I feel like I'm pretty new to this conversation. So, Yeah, definitely. So you can take something like a Bitcoin or even um, there are services that will turn like dollars into cryptocurrencies as well. And there's actually marketplaces where you can sort of swap those back and forth. So you can buy an NFT with a dollar, you could buy an NFT with a Bitcoin, and it all happens on chain. So there's sort of like a, uh, there is a sort of a mix, a mixing of those mm. types of assets. But yeah, we would refer to anything that you would think of as like a currency as like a fungible token. Um, and that includes Bitcoin. Cool. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I'm definitely getting a picture about like um, what Bitsky is and like how it's going to allow me to buy, sell, collect, own NFTs. Uh, but looking at your site, um, which is awesome, by the way, I'm a, a UI developer here at Cockroach Labs. And so I love the 90s vaporwave brutalist uh, take on your website. So props to that. Thank you. Uh, but there's a lot of sort of like talk about like how this helps artists, right? How this helps people producing NFTs. So, so what's the story there? Sure. So I think one, um, or not, I should say one, but it's just a um, great way for artists, and that can mean a huge broad spectrum, like even just yeah. like creators putting uh, digital content. And that could be artwork, music, photography, like any medium that you can. Uh, create and be able to uh, distribute it to their uh, fans and customers via uh, our platform. So uh, very similar to kind of like what Shopify has done for other goods, our platform has done that for uh, NFTs. I, li I like that comparison. Uh, I mean, especially as Shopify is kind of blowing up. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think like the one thing that kind of struck me was, um, it's probably a pretty good understanding of like selling something on the internet. Um, if I'm an artist, right. I can like produce something. I know how to put something in a box and ship it to somebody and I can use Shopify as a platform to kind of move it around. Uh, but if I'm an artist and I'm producing something, uh, I may not immediately get how to turn it into a non fungible token or like what that means or how I get paid. So is there like an education element to Bitsky? Yeah, we, we definitely try to, um, you know, educate and um, are working, doing, you know, more uh, explanations of like what it is, how, how they can do it and um, provide that as a, like a learning process for, for artists or creators entering the space. Um, we kind of intentionally with our product kind of uh, obfuscate or make that simplify the uh, connection to the blockchain so that you don't need to worry about well, yeah, what Ethereum is, how to get it, how to set up your wallet, how to, you know, what gas fees are uh, to, you know, make transactions. We yeah. kind of handle all that um, through our system, making it very easy for the artists just to focus on creating and doing what they do best and leading on our platform to execute everything else. Yeah. Yeah. That is super attractive. Uh, so as a, as Dan was asking uh, if I wanted to have this conversation and I was like, what's an NFT? And then I went and read about NFTs and I was like, yes, I do want to have this conversation. Uh, some of the things I, I sort of stumbled across were artists talking about what it is, how it helps, uh, how to sort of like get on the Ethereum chain, uh, but taking that away or at least like making that as easy as possible, I think is a very attractive prospect uh, in this kind of process and this kind of like new way of thinking about uh, art. Um, I guess like the thing I found myself wondering about, um, 
so one of the things getting talked about is like the top shots uh, mm -hmm. collectible collectibles. Um, and I think the first place I even heard of an NFT was uh, Beeple selling on Christie's for uh, six point six million. I think was the 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 amount that got streamed across the New York Times. Um, so when you when an artist puts something on the, the uh, sort of blockchain, is it still like accessible or is it like only sort of viewable? Is it? I, I was trying to like look for uh, sort of like metaphors in my mind. I'm like, is this the equivalent of the Mona Lisa has sort of one owner, uh, but it may get like loaned to uh, a uh, a museum, right? Or is this like there's still this digital asset and it can maybe get shared around the internet, but it's always owned by sort of a single person. Like are either of, the, either of those anywhere close to what's actually happening <laughs> with the non-fungible token? <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting because um, like for, if you were like a traditional artist working in traditional mediums, there's this sort of like history of what it means to sell a piece of art, what it means to buy a piece of art and own a piece of art, right? Like I can put a picture, I can take a picture of the Mona Lisa, print it out my printer and hang it on my wall, right? right. Um, but that's not the Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah. And so in this world, for the most part, right? Like if you go to our store and you see a piece of art on sale, you're gonna see a picture of it. You could download that picture and copy it around. Uh, there's nothing really stopping you from doing that. But what the blockchain does is it allows sort of the world at large to verify at any moment who owns that piece of art. And in our case, right, like anyone can, historically has been able to make an NFT if they knew how and they could yeah. sort of send it around. Um, but actually that sort of technology of like deciding who owns this thing was relatively hard to do. Um, and so when we built to our platform, we didn't really think of it as like an NFT platform, although in recent weeks with the, with the word NFT popping off, we're certainly yeah. not <laughs> shying away from it. But what we really wanted to create was a platform where people could cr upload, you know, unique pieces of, of art or other types of digital creations um, and sort of sell them and keep track of who owns them. So when you click on something, say, in your wallet. Um, right now, the sort of one of the definitive sources of the NFT world at large is a website called OpenSea, which is also a, sort of like an eBay for, for NFTs. And when you go to OpenSea, you can see this sort of history of this art from pretty much any of the NFT platforms, including ours. You can see who owned it. You can see like the whole history of who owned it. You can see what it was bought and sold for often. Um, and that's that sort of history and that ability for any website to sort of look at the blockchain and say, okay, this person does this piece of art that really um, enables that ownership. So we're seeing video games, right? Where maybe in your video game you own, you have like a piece of property, like a house or something that people can come and see. Well, that video game could let you show off your piece of art in the game and they could verify in real time that like you own it. So if you ever sold that piece of art, it would just sort of disappear from your virtual world. Things like that, um, that allow anyone with a computer to verify, yes, this person owns this piece of art and here's what it is, that's the power of it. Um, in addition, we, and also some other NFT platforms let you, let you sort of um, have private assets that uh, aren't broadcast to the world. So, you know, we have, we see people doing um, 3D pieces of art and then creating like a printer file where you could print your own version of it in real time, but only the owner of that piece of art gets access to that printer file. So anyone in the world can see like what it looks like, you know, they can see a, like a JPEG of that piece of art, but only the owner can actually download that original file. And we're seeing that with movies and music and stuff like that as well, where, um, there are things you can do to, you know, give the owner of an NFT like exclusive access. Uh, but for the most part, it's really that history and the the auditability of, of saying, I own this. And here, you know, look world, you can shut, you can see here that I'm the only owner of this. Um, and that maybe it was previously owned by this cool art collector. And 
he's really well respected, so it's worth a lot of money because you know he only buys good stuff. Yeah, and like I, I feel like that was like kind of the draw, right? Is the the cred or the uh, I mean, why do people collect art? It could be investment. It could be they're an enthusiast. It could be many reasons. Uh, but people still get to enjoy the art, I guess. Um, so I guess the engineer in me is like trying to think about like, okay, so it's an asset in a game world. It's a song, maybe it's, uh, so how does like the particular file, right? The JPEG say, uh, and the blockchain sort of like intersect. Is that a, a JPEG that like contains some code that will like allow privileges or are you accessing that JPEG through a wallet and like through this kind of like software container that is the um, Ethereum, I guess in this case. Yeah, so the JPEGs are essentially all public. Um, either they're like on a CDN or they're, people are using um, a system called IPFS, which is sort of like, uh, sort of a little bit like BitTorrent, um, but it lets you sort of share things with the world. So all those assets are essentially public and um, what on the blockchain is just sort of a reference to that and seeing who owns that asset. Mm. Uh, that's that's really what NFTs empower. And like I was saying, we do allow people to keep things private that aren't sort of broadcast to the world. And then that sort of goes through us. We're sort of the gatekeeper and we say, okay, if you want to download this file, you have to verify that you own it. Um, but. And but that ability to unlock things is also being used in other cases. So like musicians are sometimes selling like exclusive like copies of an album, and maybe it's the same album is going to stream in two months. You just get it a month early. But then in yeah. addition, if you own this special copy, you know you get a VIP ticket to the next concert. Um, so there's lots of things you can sort of tie to these beyond just like JPEGs and stuff. Uh, but yeah, if you think about it, what's on the blockchain itself is just sort of a record of who owns it. Gotcha. Like a record of who owns it with some kind of fingerprint for that asset, right? Some way to like mm -hmm. identify that asset. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so like maybe we dive into the namesake of the show. Uh, how did you build it? Uh, what, uh, what does this service look like um, beyond like the website? Like what does the stack look like? What challenges like i don't know let's like identify the parts before we kind of scratch the surface and kick the tires absolutely um so when we started this our our idea was sort of like a uh like a venmo for nfts where it was like an easy way because this was you know two years ago nfts existed but they were really hard to work with and they were really hard to deal with and you had to install this funky software it was just a mess um, so we're like, why don't we build a really simple app that lets you see your NFTs and collect them and share them. And we, that was sort of mostly like a traditional web app and it was relatively easy, but pretty quickly we realized that there were two major pieces missing. Um, one was a secure way to keep your private keys. So everything on Ethereum is linked to a cryptographic key pair and Traditionally, what would happen is you would generate one of these on your computer and it would be completely unique. And then you would be told by some software, okay, now write this down and put it like in a safe and never ever lose it. Um, and we've all heard the stories now with, with people losing yeah. millions of Bitcoins from the private keys. And so we figured, okay, if someone's gonna install like this casual app, they wanna just download some NFTs, um, there's no way we can know if they did that properly. So, <laughs> how do we make sure they don't have to worry about that? Hmm. And that led us to our first big technical challenge, which was storing keys in a secure way. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people have sort of put keys on um, either like storing them in users' browsers or storing them on a database. And inevitably at some point they get hacked. Um, and when you lose a private key, there's no way that you know that you lost it and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so um, the only the only thing you can really do is try to move everything that was associated with that private key off of it as quickly as you can. Um, and that costs a bunch of crypto. So 
yeah. very, 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 um, very, very bad if any of these things leak. Uh, and we've just seen it time and time again. So we looked at the banking industry and they've been keeping private keys safe for a long time in a, uh, these devices called hard hardware security modules. And they're basically a sort of digital lockbox for keys um, that allows them to be safely replicated amongst like a, a bunch of these different HSMs. So it's all securely um, backed up. And it allows you sort of to use the key, but never to actually see it. So when we sign a transaction with these HSMs, we tell the HSM to sign a transaction. And uh, but we don't get access to the key at all. So the key never leaks in that case. And what that means is that if there were some sort of security breach, we could literally just like turn off the HSMs and all transactions would stop. Uh, and then because it's a bit, because they've been building these for years, they're, they're, they're sort of crazy. Like if you try to drill into them or shake them too much or uh, just even just open the case of them, they wipe themselves. Um, wow. So they're pretty cool pieces of hardware. Um, <laughs> but the technology that basically is inside them for, for Bitcoin and for blockchains uh, isn't really available at all in the cloud. Hmm. So in order to get these things running, we had to sort of take a step back from what everyone in the industry has been doing for 20 years and move away from the cloud and move back to data centers where we can show up with a, these HSM boxes and put them in a rack and put a key on the rack and that type of stuff and um, keep them, basically sort of run them ourselves. I see. So I think when you were describing that initially, I'm imagining, you know, big bank vault, giant door in the middle on a velvet table. There's like very <laughs> paranoid computers, right? And I'm immediately thinking like, Boy, that sounds like a bottleneck if you have to like call a bank every time. But you're talking about you're buying these paranoid little computers and then you're taking them to data centers um, that you own and control and like you put them in the rack. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, how do you manage, uh, I guess like cost scale? I mean, I'm thinking like there's a reason we moved to the cloud. So like mm -hmm. what kind of challenges is that uh, creating for you guys? Yeah, so one of the big advantages of the cloud is the upfront costs are very low. So yeah. I want to boot up a server um, in a data center. I have to sign a contract at the data center. I have to buy the server for thousands of dollars. And I have to put it in there. I have to spend time doing it. And then if tomorrow I decide I don't need it, <laughs> right? Then <laughs> I don't go on eBay and start selling these things. Like, um, right. So it was a huge initial investment and a risk mm -hmm. to sort of set that up in the first place, especially before we had like any customers or knew that it would okay. be profitable. Um, but yeah, that was that was just a cost and a, an investment we had to make. Um, and then, you know, beyond just racking that, you know, in order to, in order to do anything with these hardware security modules, we need to have computers hooked up to them and um, network equipment and all that and of course databases and those all had to be in the data center as well so we're not just it's not just that we can't put these hsms up it's that we sort of have to replicate a lot of what we have in the cloud back into these data centers um but luckily you know people you know 20 years ago this is what every startup did so um <laughs> you know there's a known there's a known procedure here and it's not like yeah. we're reinventing the wheel or anything Hey, yeah, that's a fair point. There's a reason we moved to the cloud, but before we did that, uh, we, we certainly had a playbook for standing up a data center. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, great. So, like, what? So, besides this paranoid magical uh, box, like, what what are the parts of the tech stack uh, are you building, mm -hmm. kind of like around these HSMs? Yeah. So we really have sort of, I would say. Um, there's sort of three, ma uh, four major components. We have our sort of our keys we talked about. Hmm. Um, the next is we have a just a user database authentication system, um, and that's of course needed to protect those keys. So when you sign up as a user, we sort of assign a key to you, uh, but we need to make sure that you and only you get access to that. So we have a whole you know a nice authentication system with 
two-factor authentication, email resets, and it's set up in a way that um, is designed to limit the ability to like fish people, designed to limit the ability to, you know, just break into someone's account. Because if you, you know, if you did get access to the account, we could lock you out at some point, but you could start doing malicious things um, right away. And sort of the, the nature of this is, uh, is such that potentially we needed the ability to have banking level security on this. So we essentially had to build our own. We've used some open source technologies to uh, facilitate parts of that. But we essentially had to build our own, you know, authentication system um, that sat right next to HSMs. Uh, and then, so those are the first two parts. And then the next two parts are essentially what you see when you go to bitsky.com. Um, our user wallet, which lets you actually do things with your keys. It lets you see the assets you own. It lets you securely move them around, send them to people. Um, and it lets you integrate with other NFT applications like OpenSea that enable even more features. Uh, and then the last piece that's relatively new is uh, sort of our creator portal that lets people create their own NFTs. And both the user wallet and the creator portal are powered by the same authentication system because in order to create NFTs, you need a private key as well. Um, so both of those sort of sit on, sit on top of that system. Yeah, that's, uh, and yeah, you're describing it so it's like, right. So a famous problem amongst cryptocurrency is like, print out this paper key, put it in a thing. Like if you ever lose it, like there goes like whatever. So it's so like wrapping that in a more traditional authentication system, um, which it sounds like the right idea to sort of like homegrown that, right? If that's like kind of the bread and butter of the platform, like we want to make, you want to make sure you get that right. Yeah. Um, we, we always say kind of internally, uh, our wallets do two things very well. One, high level security for your digital assets. And then also protect the user against themselves for misplacing their keys and everything. Cause like the horror stories that you've seen, you know, heard and right. seen, like we don't, we want to execute extremely well on both those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect. What, um, yeah, like name some names besides Cockroach DB. I know that lives in the stack somewhere. Uh, what are the kinds of tech are you using to build? Uh, either those wallets or like the thing that strips the web. Um, it's a homegrown authentication uh, solution, but like what kind of tools are you using to build that? Yeah, so we are like, so one of the things with these wallets is that a lot of applications want to be able to talk to them. So when mm -hmm. you go to OpenSea, um, they have all these cool features around auctions and moving NFTs and seeing NFTs. Um, they need access to this wallet as well, but they don't, we don't want to give them full access, right? It's not just a name. Right. So we, we use sort of a just OAuth standard to let those third party sites get limited access to your wallet. They can sort of see uh, the public side of, of your, um, and they can sort of request things from it, but they can't actually do anything with your wallet yourself. Uh, and to power that we use a uh, open source, OAuth provider called Hydra, um, which is a really nice thin layer that just handles all that messy stuff. OAuth is this thousand, thousand you know, multi-thousand page specification by some yeah. internet standards. Um, and we don't want to deal with all those things. So uh, they've been very good at like at keeping at basically handling all those open source specs. Um, and right around when we started looking at them, they adopted cockroach DB support. So um, that was pretty great for us. And so they do all the, they make sure that user sessions are, you know, synced up and that you, when you log out, you can, you know, if you change your password, all your sessions go away, that type of thing um, is all handled by them. Um, and then sort of on a lower level we're running, because we didn't have access to the cloud, we've um, needed to build we basically needed to build a, a system for all those things that we take for granted in the cloud. Um, so we ended up using uh, a Kubernetes distribution from Red Hat that lets us, you know, it it's like a pipeline for building our applications, for shipping them, for rolling them out without any downtime um, and all those types of things. 
Great. So why Cockroach TV? Um, which anyone joining the stream from Cockroach is going to want to know the answer to, or maybe they already do. Uh, in this like sort of like space, um, you have a few choices in terms of like database or like what what made Cockroach attractive? What what made it the right fit for you? Yeah. Um, so one of our uh, biggest concerns with these hardware security modules is the fact that they sort of wipe themselves in order to prevent anything from leaking, um, which we want to have happen because if someone does break into a data center or something like that, we 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 we'd rather have them destroy the keys and have to recover from a backup than um, anything else. But there's always a ch so our first data center um, was located in the Bay Area, and there's always a chance there's going to be an earthquake around here. Um, and so we're thinking, okay, an earthquake happens and all our our keys get wiped. Um, what do we do? So uh, we set up another data center on the east coast, and that's great for our keys, um, but. We now need to deal with, you know, multi-region failover replication of our database, um, and our first solution was sort of a traditional Postgres uh, master, you know, replica type scenario. And um, one of the nice things about these cloud platforms, like like our Kubernetes platform, is that you can sort of do these like rolling upgrades without any um, mm -hmm. without any downtime, but the system we had in place for Cockroach meant that if we ever needed to do an upgrade or if a server went down, uh, there was sort of this weird, funky mess trying to get the like primary database to be recognized again and, and failovers and stuff. And so we had a couple instances where we were out, you know, for like 15, 20 minutes or something. It's like we had to go in and like manually like flip some switch. And we were think like, you know that was fine in the early days, but as we were getting customers on board, um, and we now have like these on on sales right where everyone needs this thing to be up right now. Like those types of outages just weren't acceptable, and so um, the combined you know need for both those solutions led us to to wanting a system that would just manage the geo replication, the failover, all those things um, seamlessly, and. We were already on Postgres, so Cockroach was an easy solution, um, and it was supported in all our platforms. So, uh, honestly, we tried it out. We put it in Radio Center. We, you know, took down servers to see what happened, and um, we've had we we've had actually data centers go offline for periods of time, like our complete region go offline for a period of time um, for unrelated reasons, and essentially on the database layer, just there was there was nothing. Everything just kept on working, so we were we were pretty impressed with that. Um, especially since we probably could have done a little more testing on it before we went live, um, <laughs> uh, but we didn't have to, and that was great. Yeah, well, we appreciate that trust, and I'm glad I'm glad we could deliver on being as resilient <laughs> as we as we say we are. Uh, I got another question from the chat. Uh, I've used Bitsky platform and the Topshop platform to buy NFTs. Uh, they were very different experiences. Can you guys talk about what choices you've made to try to limit the delays I got on Topshop? Um, yeah. yeah, performance is definitely <laughs> going to be uh, a big question when talking about blockchain, like famous, Absolutely. famously CPU intensive. Uh, yeah, how are you guys dealing with um, just the burden of, of, of doing blockchain transactions? Yeah, so an interesting thing about blockchain is um, it, for the most part, it takes at least like a minute for any transaction to really go yeah. through. And so if you build a sort of basic system, um, everything takes like up to a minute to happen, which is fine for most of the tr uh, original blockchain systems because um they were like if, if it takes me a minute to send money to you that's pretty good compared to you know a bank others. transfer sure yeah that's great um but the problem really comes to when you as a company want to do this because yeah. if it takes you a minute to do every single thing right if i sell a hundred nfts it's going to take me over an hour to get those nfts delivered to people um, and so one of the things that 
we did early on, um, before we really got into the actually the art creator space, was we saw this need from a bunch of other customers. So we've actually built an entire developer platform before we built our art creator, where we assumed that we wouldn't be the sort of art NFT platform, that yeah. someone else would build a platform on our infrastructure. Um, but no one really did, and so we ended up building our own. But we had already built the, the infrastructure in place to um, to power those types of marketplaces because we were seeing a lot of um, interesting projects coming out that were getting stuck because they didn't have the rails. And so one of the systems we've built is uh, what we call a transaction operator. And you can basically tell it, hey, I want to make this blockchain transaction happen. Um, and I don't really care. I don't really want to know the details. Just, just make it happen. So just send this NFT to this person. Just create this NFT. Um, and in the back end, we we queue all those things up, and we essentially predict what we're going to need in the blockchain, and get everything ready to go. And then we broadcast it to the blockchain as quickly as possible. So um, we've sort of taken a few of those uh, those bottlenecks out, and um, instead instead of sending one every, you know, instead of waiting a minute and sending the next one, we'll actually broadcast, you know, a thousand different transactions blockchain at once. And um, they'll basically go through very quickly. And a lot of our competitors are, are, you know, they're trying to adopt that now, but we already sort of had this platform in place, which is why our system for the most part, if you buy something, it's delivered within a minute. Um, and actually when we, when we built this, a lot of, we we looked at other um, solutions to this, and people were using things like um, like Kafka or something to try to get this sort of very rapid queue going. Um, and most of those things actually sort of broke. Um, they couldn't really keep track of the details you needed in order to do this. Um, we built our first one using um, etcd, uh, which was a little better. It basically let us. Um, keep track of, of some of the state for these future transactions in a single place. Uh, but uh, we actually, our modern, our, our current one, this is just pure cockroach. Um, we essentially have just a couple of indexes designed the way we need to do it. And we dump transactions into our cockroach database and they sort of, and we basically are able to validate if they're gonna go through on the database level um, so we can, basically create tokens as fast as our database can can create them. And then we have just a task in the background that once those are created, then we relay them to the blockchain. Uh, and that has been shown to just be an order of magnitude faster than what most everyone else is doing. Um, so for a heavy on sale, where it might take one of, our, one of the other uh, uh, NFT marketplaces two or three days to catch up, um, we're done in an hour or two. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty um, important to us. You know, we we get, even with like, even with things are like five or 10 minutes late, we get support requests because our, our sort of marketplace and sort of the philosophy we're working on is that it's not really about people who know about NFTs and want to get access to NFTs. It's really about using NFTs to power something that people always wanted, which is, um, you know, the ability to like sell sell digital art and sell digital unique items just as well as you could um, could physical ones. And so when something, when something doesn't get delivered, they're not thinking, oh, the blockchain is slow. They're not thinking, oh yeah, of yeah. course it takes us, you know, two days to mint through an NFT queue. Um, they're expecting this to be similar to if they had bought, you know, a, an album, which is that it's basically almost immediately available. Yeah. Um, and so, in order to do that, there's really no way to do that in a blockchain native way. You have to do it in your own database first and then sort of push it to the blockchain um, as fast as you can. Yeah, so I guess this is, it's like, you're not really making the blockchain faster. You're kind of working around the limitations of the blockchain. As you're describing this, it sounds of like, Something we do in the in the front end, which is like an opportunistic uh, change, right? Like a user clicks something and then we'll change it immediately, even though there may be something slow happening on the back, and that we're kind of like waiting. We'll like opportunistically say, you know, the change has already happened, which doesn't actually sound like what's happening here. 
it's you know that a transaction might take a minute and so you're just going to queue up a lot of trans and do a, a lot of other transactions that take a minute all at once rather than like doing them in sequence right so it's it's not as if someone's buying something and then you're sort of uh saying the transaction's done uh, you're still having to wait a minute right to like deliver or like sell or whatever it's just that you're able to leverage the cockroach database to kind of like queue those up, make those kind of all happen at once. Uh, sounds very cool uh, and a really <laughs> cre creative way to use cockroach. Yeah, and you want the feedback immediately. Like if something's going to yeah. sell out or things like that, um, you want that type of feedback uh, as fast as possible. Um, but yeah, so like right now, Ethereum does every a block. Ethereum batches everything into blocks. A block is about every 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. And there's a roughly only 250 transactions that can happen in a block. So we're we're definitely there's a there are there are definitely limits to even our platform. If yeah. we if we took over the entire Ethereum blockchain and no one else got access to it, um, we could only sell a thousand NFTs a second or a minute. Uh, that's just the limitation of all of Ethereum right now, um, and it is a reason why. Well, it's kind of funny when, um, uh, yeah, our, the, uh, Dan, who has this question, mentioned Topshot. Uh, Topshot is built on their own blockchain. They're essentially the only person on it. They built the front end. They built the wallet. They built the entire rails of the blockchain. Um, it's not on Ethereum, and the delays on their side are not due in any way to anyone else. <laughs> um, any delays they have are either intentional to prevent fraud or mm -hmm. technical um, because Top Shot is brand new and um, yeah. they just built it. So. Uh, but yeah, the those types of delays are inevitable at some point on Ethereum as these things get bigger. Um, and you'll probably see uh, marketplaces like ours saying, hey, this is a heavy on sale. This is a, there's a lot of this being sold. This is going to take longer, and giving you like sort of a an estimated time of delivery as opposed to sort of saying it's going to be there right away. Um, but for now, if you want to sell, you know, a trans, you know, if you want to sell an NFT every second, um, you're going to be able to do that just fine, and things are going to go through very quickly. Yeah, I mean, could that potentially almost be like a driver of scarcity? Um, you know, around the cockroach Slack channels we've been talking about drops, you know, and like sort of like artists doing like releases. And uh, and I'm thinking like, if we trans, you know, if we translate this to like a, a sneaker drop or like, you know, uh, something in the physical world where, uh, you know, I used to work in the Lower East Side and there was like a Supreme store and a walk by and I don't think I, not one time did I not see uh, some hundreds of kids lined up to like try and buy six skateboards that came in that day or whatever. And so, I mean, I almost feel like if there's this like batching and there's like, we only have 400 of something, right? That like, there, there's almost a, uh, a an expected mindset or an expected like sort of metaphor, uh, at least for that particular type of transaction or that particular type of commerce. Uh, I think that might be more of a struggle when, I think I read a headline in the last week that said, the Kings of Leon are gonna release uh, an album as an NFT. And I was like, well, how many albums do the Kings of Leon sell? And uh, maybe people won't be used to waiting um, an hour to get uh, an album. So like, I think there are definitely, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new world, I think, so. Yeah, kind of excited. Yeah, and it's funny because it's something where the technology sort of is influencing the mm. not necessarily the art, but I mean, I guess sort of the art too. Because you're as an artist, you're encouraged not to create a lot of pieces, right, or a lot of copies. Mm. You're encouraged to create a few copies and sell them for a higher price point. Uh, so be, just because of, of of that reason, we're sort of limited in the number of transactions we can do at the moment. Um, so, you know, uh, a Blau did an album as an auction, and I think there were 30 copies of it that he made. Um, and and then 
you just that went to the top 30 bidders and so that was something where um the yeah he, he you know you can't you can't sell a million copies of an nft um in any reason amount of time at the moment um on on any platform uh although there are sort of alternative chains that are looking at addressing this. Yeah. Uh, so that may be possible in the near future. But um, yeah, we had a question here from Dan about why NFT marketplaces do drops. And I think it's sort of for a similar reason. You want to get the hype. You want to get a lot of people buying sort of at once in order to make it feel exciting. Yeah. Um, but you're limited into how many you can do. So um, you, you, you know, you get, you try to get the pricing right. You try to get things a little more exclusive and unique and quickly. And it's all sort of, um, we're just taking like leads from the existing like Supreme and, and you know, like Nike sneaker drops that have done this in the past because they've been the ones that have been selling sort of this batch of this type of item in the real world. Yeah. Kind of replicating what you would do in the real world, um, you know, like lining up for the Supreme drop and everything, but bringing that into uh, online um, and having other like buying dynamics in terms of like auctions or open editions for a certain period of time. Those mechanics work very well to kind of uh, create the demand and also the exclusivity um, for that specific NFT. Dan's got another question here. Uh, do you advise the artists on how to do pricing? Yeah, and like in this like kind of model of uh, scarcity or like rarity, um, yeah. Do you have opinions? Is that a conversation you're having with artists, or does the does the artist get to choose whatever you know, charge what they want? I mean, um, yeah. At the end of the day, we do have some um, advice and kind of uh, input on that, but we kind of leave the creative control uh, to the artist. Um, it's their work, and you know they know their audience best. Um, but the the main point is that we want to you know start lower, um, just because the what their you know normal fans or followers um, are used to. This is something new, and they're not used to like okay, like what actually can I do with this asset? And mm -hmm. that kind of like learning and adoption is uh, getting more widespread. Like oh, if I own this asset, I can. Uh, bring it into a game or um, use it in different simulations or have it be correlated to like a snap filter or something um, that has you know, much more uh, dimensions to the NFT. So um, kind of having that uh, starting low and building up so that your following will get used to uh, what they're buying is kind of the basic principle that we kind of advise on. Yeah, and since we're talking about you know, drops and scarcity and like, I, I guess like in my head, I was like imagining is the future of NFTs commerce, but it doesn't sound like that's at least right now appropriate for the uh, for the technology, right? It is more about uh, uniqueness, right? And it is more about like uh, ownership of an artifact uh, rather than I'm just buying an album or I'm just buying a whatever, uh, an image. So I guess when you're like pitching to artists, because I mean, I, I, so my partner is a sort of graphic designer and artist. And when we first started talking about NFTs, uh, I think she immediately jumped to like, this is a way to like protect copyright, which I guess it kind of is certainly. But I mean, are you, would you recommend to an artist to like put everything they ever make on like an NFT uh, to like be a deliverable uh, for a client or is that like, is the technology not really going to allow for that level of like transaction? Yeah, I mean, I think um, putting everything on there, uh, technically, yes, you could, but it's just more of like the scarcity and the demand yeah. side of it. Um, other things to consider are like, what's the uh, application? Like, what's the the use for? Is it just you know straight a uh, collectible or? does this nft have other um use cases so what we get really excited about is where other simulations um whether it be virtual like video games virtual worlds or um like other you know filters in terms of like snap instagram um where you can kind of pull or bring in your 
virtual you know nfts into those uh simulations and they can uh open up a new experience so like a sword in one video game what does that look like in another video game does that doesn't need to be like a one-to-one -one. it could be you know access to uh a different like level different you know uh, yeah. portion of the video game like there's other things where you can like buy like for example if you buy you know an album from an artist um that gives you access to a certain portion of a virtual world to go see a live concert um like travis scott did a concert within Fortnite, and so can you pair a access to that concert with an nft um that's what we kind of see coming in the next uh probably you know year or so uh, which gets us really excited about yeah and, and then there's kind of an amazing beyond, idea yeah. beyond that like you know going two three years out I think that we're going to see that um, that amount of transactions that can go through at any given time increase drastically. There's a couple of technologies that are just in the works now that are going to enable that. Um, and what's cool there is that once you start being able to do more on the blockchain, you're going to be able to do things like like sell a collection of art pieces where you can, you know, they're all individual pieces, but if you have a certain set of them, you can sort of combine them into something new. Um, <clears throat> we're going to see items where you could buy a digital avatar and dress it with digital outfits that now belong to that avatar. Um, we're going to see things, we're already seeing things with like AR where you could like wear AR clothing, but there might be situations where like, you know, wearing that AR clothing, combining other things unlocks new features. And um, there's just an, a, a huge amount of, of possibilities once we have these this sort of collection of NFTs that people start having, what you can do with those. Um, and the there's yeah, a hundred startups right now just getting started on this and they're all gonna be launching in the next couple of years and it's gonna be it's gonna be cool. Yeah, this is really invoking images of Ready Player One for me right now, where there's like worlds within worlds and ideas. In, in the multiverse, and I, I definitely caught the language on, on the website around the multiverse, and yeah, that is a super cool idea. Well, with the last few minutes we have left, uh, any parting thoughts, anything we didn't get to talk about, anything you guys want to say while you got the platform? <laughs> uh, no, this has been great, and yeah, thanks for, for the time, Nathan, and the support from Cockroach, but um, yeah, just um, we're excited, and if anyone is, you know, building and interested um, in getting started with NFTs, um, we'd happy to um, be the platform to, to support and educate and support creators in the space. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, Bitsky.com, check them out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll say goodbye and I'll, I'll wrap it up here. So thanks so much for your time, guys. Yeah, thank you, thank you Nathan. Thanks, Cockroach team. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, this video is going to be uh, on YouTube and uh, ready to go. So check out those links. We'll post links to uh, Bitsky and some of the references we made in this conversation. If you're curious about Cockroach, uh, check us out on cockroachlabs.com. Join our uh, Slack channel. Check out our GitHub. Commit to our open source projects. And uh, stay tuned for more conversations with more creators. See you next time.